the B on the top? Oh. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That's really dissonant. I didn't realize that that was in there. I guess it's because you changed the octave of the sounds. It's like if you put it in this context, it doesn't work. You put it in this, it works. Whoa, nice. You put an A over it. No, that doesn't work. That works.
Well, good afternoon, and thank you to those that are here. And uh, we know we got a bunch of people out that are normally here on, on Wednesdays. Uh, some are not feeling well, and others are, are out with a family that are recovering, and so we want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, but as we begin today, I want to welcome those who are watching online, and especially this week. Let me just give you a few announcements, and then we'll pray. Uh, first of all, Ron Musser's um, celebration service will be this Friday at 11 o'clock. And they will uh, receive friends and family uh, at, at a visitation prior to that, at starting at 10. So from 10 to 11, uh, you can come and, and see Alice and the family. And uh, then the service will start promptly at 11. After the service, we'll go to Bushnell, to the National Cemetery for... Uh, his uh, internment so that will be up there I know some have asked about food can they bring it to you know to minister to the family um, they're going to do that at, at Musser's home so if you'll call the church office we can give you that address and you can uh, drop it by later Friday afternoon say around 3 45 4 o'clock as all the family's going to gather there since they're coming back from Bushnell and uh, so that's uh, the information on that service but I do want to remember uh, some of our folks uh, uh, Brother Skip's not feeling well just some, some stomach issues going on there so he's trying to get in to see his doctor and, and uh, Carol Reno hasn't been well for uh, several days now and so she and Don are at home and uh, also want to keep uh, Deb Clark in our prayers uh, she had a very very long surgery yesterday the surgeon, when he came in to meet with us before she went in, he said, now, I'm not a clock watcher. And, buddy, let me tell you, he wasn't. Uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, he's very meticulous and very precise, and he was able to do the best-case scenario procedure for her. And uh, so uh, she did not get out of surgery until about 7.30 last night. And... Uh, she is still in recovery because they didn't have any beds. So pray that they can find a room for her today that uh, she can get out of the recovery. Because uh, Kennedy was telling me just some of the stories of things that's going on in the curtains next door, you know, everybody coming in. So, so uh, it's pretty, you know, rambunctious and uh, noisy. And I know uh, she would rest well. But this morning she, uh, we were texting early, and, and she said she was feeling well, doing well. And uh, so we just praise God for that. And uh, right now, uh, uh, Christine Abercrombie is having her hip replaced. And uh, so keep her in your prayers as Pastor Stephen was able to see her before she went in this morning. And then also Brenda Rodriguez is having her knee redone tomorrow. So we want to remember her. So, pardon? Did I hear somebody? Okay peanut gallery over here being being active all right need to pray for joe he's already started i ain't even got preaching yet but no let's go to the lord father we come to you today and wow just thank you for answered prayers thank you for what was a long day for kennedy and and deb as uh, she had that procedure we uh, just give thanks for for the progress for how well it went and lord we do pray that uh, you would open up a room here shortly that, that they could get her moved where she could, could just rest quietly. And uh, also for Kennedy as he is there with her. And pray for her sister and brother-in-law as uh, Barb and Steve come in this evening that, that you would just bless them with traveling uh, grace and, and that they'll be able to get here safely and be able to spend time with, uh, with Deb and them uh, starting tomorrow. Father, also... We do lift up the Musser family to you. And Lord, for Tim and Carla and Sherry and, and for their families and extended families, we just ask for your continued comfort. And Lord, especially for Miss Alice, uh, uh, not only in this time where you have seen fit to bless Ron by allowing him to come home, but Lord, also her brother who is... Uh, under hospice care right now and she's really the, uh, the sole sibling and, and gives some direction and care there for him and but Lord she just has a lot on her and I uh, thank you that that you can be her 
your sufficiency, and we trust you to do that for her. Lord, we do lift Christine up to you, that everything is going well with her procedure, and that it won't be very long till we get a good report on her. And Lord, for Lenny and Brenda, as they go down tomorrow to Tampa to have that knee done, we ask your blessings on her. Father, you know the other needs as well. You know those on our list that we're praying for that will come to know you. We simply say, Lord, uh, here they are. And we ask that you would answer those prayers. And as we worship you today and as we gather to sing and to, to look at your word, we just pray that you would be honored. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, won't you stand with me together and let's magnify the greatness of God together. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul. Bearing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Pastor Andy, I think it was last week did this Psalm 139, and I haven't been able to get it out of my mind and out of my heart, because I'm just so thankful that God is personal with us. I know we talk about this a lot, how he stands far away on his throne in unapproachable light, the scripture says. 
but he's also near to us and close to us as a friend. And what was preached last week was Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. How many of you are thankful to be hemmed in by the Lord behind and before? And lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. And that's what I wanted us to think about as we're singing in the garden a song that's very personal, where we walk with Jesus and he walks with us. Glory to God that we get to do that. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me And He talks with me And He tells me I am His own And the joy Tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave. sweet song, Lord. Thank you for the reminder that we do walk with you. And Lord, I am thankful for the picture that you give us of the garden with Adam listening to you coming to him in the cool of the day. I can't imagine what that would be like to walk that closely and that intimately with the Holy God. But in part, in this life, we get to be in the already but not yet. And Lord, we already have your Holy Spirit with us in every single moment of every day. And as we get closer and closer to eternity, one day we're going to step into eternity and realize the fullness of what you've given us, that we can walk with you. When we see your face and your glory and your light fills everything. And Lord, we look forward to that day. And Lord, I just pray for 
the message that's coming in these next few moments. I pray that it would change our hearts. It might motivate us for the mission of God. It might help us to think about our world outside of ourselves. But also, Lord, it would, also, it would direct our focus and attention to you alone and magnify your greatness. So use Pastor Randy in these next few moments to speak to us. We can't wait to hear what you have to say to us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And if you would, turn with me uh, over to the 142nd Psalm. Uh, the 142nd. This is actually uh, a cave psalm. Uh, several of the psalms that David penned, he wrote them while he was old up in a cave um, and it could have been written in one of two caves it could have been written in the cave of Adullam or in the one in En Gedi uh, just above the, there in the hills above uh, the north end of the Dead Sea and you say well why was he in a cave well <laughs> he was a man on the run when you look at the life of David, uh, he went very quickly from being a young man who experienced great glory to one who, who seemed to have ghastly consequences. Uh, he was the hero of the nation, and before he could even turn around, he was now the hunted by the king. And uh, so David experienced a roller coaster life there in those years as he was battling the the jealousy of King Saul as well as uh, the jealousy that he had toward many in the nation who, who flocked to uh, be a part of David's you know, support group. But nine times when you look in 1 Samuel 19 and chapter 20, uh, there's nine times there that it mentions that King Saul desired to kill him, uh, that he wanted him dead. And so, you know, in the early days... Uh, David ran. He ran a lot. And Adalam was the, was the region he went to. And you say, well, where is Adalam? We know where En Gedi is because, like I said, it's down on the north uh, west end of the Dead Sea. Uh, there on the tip. Uh, you can go there today and there's still a, like a waterfall coming out of the mountains. If you, you know, at the right time of the year, you can see you know, water coming down a few hundred yards back up into this this uh, crevice and uh, there are many caves there and it's believed that it's in one of those caves that David and his men hid out but Adalam was uh, the one that he hid in probably the earliest in his life and it is somewhere in what we also know as the valley of the shadow of death it was located there uh, on the route from Jericho up to Jerusalem and uh, they, they used to not go there, but the last couple of times I've been to Israel, we have made that stop at two different vantage points where you're able to overlook uh, that lower valley, which is where the original road that ran from Jericho to Jerusalem was located. And the reason why it was called the Valley of the Shadow of Death is because a lot of thieves and robbers hung out there. And it was just a great place to you know, to ambush the travelers as they were coming through. And so it was one of those caves uh, that it was called Adalam, or Adalam, that they believed that David was there. And it, he was there initially by himself, but on one occasion, uh, we know it had to be a pretty good-sized cave because not only would he later be joined by some men, but even his family, uh, a lot of his extended family in Bethlehem had to come and stay with him because they feared for their own safety back at home. And so this is one of those psalms that, uh, that is really written against how he is being pursued and how he starts out here in this cave. He's very lonely and I'm sure tense from all the circumstances uh, because when he got to Adalam, he was by himself. He had a few followers, uh, you know, those that travel with him. But when they went down to Gath, uh, they were all arrested. And they hadn't been released yet. But David was able to get out because he pretended to be a crazy man. And uh, the king says, I'm not going to mess with that guy. You know, he may have rabies or something. I mean, you know, he was just acting crazy. And so, you know, the king let him go. 
but his other followers, which was just very few, they weren't let, you know, out of the care of their army yet. And so he, and still he didn't even have a huge following. It was just a few of those guys. But we also call this, if you'll look there, it's, it says this is a mass kill, a mass kill of David. Now, what's a mass kill? That is a song or a poem or it is a compilation that has been put together that is really one that speaks of instruction. It's, it's lessons that he has learned or the writer has learned in life that he's now sharing with others, sharing it in the form of a song so they can be praised, but also say, hey, there's a word here. There's something you need to, to learn. Now, you would think because it was one of David's psalms that it would have been in the hymn book immediately. But it wasn't until David had passed and, and Hezekiah was in power that Hezekiah, who also, as we've talked about, you know, he experienced a lot of, you know, anxiety and a lot of assault there in Jerusalem on his kingdom and his, uh, his you know, reign over uh, the area. So he was probably the one who took this psalm and had it added to the temple hymn book. And so let's just work through it this morning. It's just, uh, or this afternoon, it's just seven verses. He says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I plead aloud to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. I reveal my trouble to him. Although my spirit is weak within me, you know my way. And so here in verses 1 and 2, we see that he's clearly under duress. Uh, he's the subject of this persistent manhunt that, that's been going on now for months, if not uh, a couple of years at this point. Uh, he wasn't welcome in Philistia. Uh, he didn't have any friends there. Uh, like I said, he went down to Gath, and he escaped, but what few guys that were joining him, they didn't escape. And, and because of him being in Gath, you remember what happened? A whole family of priests were put to death because they aided David. And so that sent a message out that, you know, people began to treat him like he had the COVID. I mean, you know, don't come around me. I mean, I don't, you know, don't, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And so what do we see here? It says, I cry out to the Lord. Now, there's several ways to pray. Um, most of the time, how do we pray? Silently, don't we? We pray silently. But here it says he cried out. Actually, twice it says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead aloud to the Lord. Now, is it really necessary to pray out loud? Can you pray silently? Yes, you can pray silently. But what we see here is I believe when you find yourself in real duress, when you find yourself, you know, feeling, you know, the heat coming down on your neck, and you're not sure what's getting ready to happen. Uh, sometimes it's great just to speak it, to say it out loud. And the reason for that is because when you pray aloud, it allows you to articulate your thoughts. You're able to put them into better words instead of just thinking them. And, and also remember this. When you just think a prayer, when you just pray silently to yourself, who else is in your head along with your thoughts? Satan himself. I mean, that's how he gets at us. He, that's where he first enters us as far as trying to tempt us or trying to discourage us. He puts thoughts in our heads. And, and if you've been around long enough, you, you know. You know what does the, you say, well, I ought to be able to recognize the devil. Because if I have a thought in my head that's from the devil, I ought to be able to, to know it. Well, the problem is, he doesn't have an Assyrian or Babylonian accent. He sounds just like Kona Joe over here. I mean, if it's in Joe's head. He's got that Hawaiian accent. But for Nancy, that's not the case. It's totally different. Why? Because it sounds just like Nancy. That's the way the devil is. I mean, he is a deceiver, and, and when he puts thoughts in our heads, he makes us almost believe it's our thoughts, but the reality is it's his thoughts. And so when we're praying, if we're just praying silently, Satan is able to many times get crafty and insert things into our minds 
and make us think, well, there's no need to pray this because it's not going to happen anyway. Other times people pray, they, they're so burdened that they groan. You remember over in the New Testament, it says there that there are times that the Holy Spirit will interpret your groanings and he will tell, you know, the Lord what you need. Now, of course, the Lord already knows it. But he is the messenger. He's the one who takes it to our great mediator and, and intercessor, which is Jesus Christ. And uh, now, don't mistake, this isn't, you know, people say, well, that's speaking in tongues. No. Haven't you ever been to a point where you just didn't know what to say? And you just went, mm, or Lord, mm, man. The best thing you do right then is just say, Lord, I, I can't even put it in words, but I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to tell the Father what I need. Tell the, tell the Son what it is I need. So there's groaning in praying, and there's thinking in praying, or silently, and then there's enunciating, but there's also writing your prayers. Uh, I had a pastor tell me this years ago. I, I read it in one of his books that if you're having trouble concentrating when you pray, get you a, a blank notebook and write your prayers out. As you're praying them, just write them out. And uh, he said he started doing that. And what was so good about it, he found it kept him on task, kept his mind focused on what he was concerned about or what he was praising God. Because it wasn't was a petition book. It was, it was a praise book as well where he praised God for answered prayers, praised him for his greatness, praised him for his name, for all the names that he is. And he went through all of this. But he says he found it to be encouraging months later that he could go back and he could see how God worked in every one of those circumstances. And, and a lot of times, if, it, if the Lord answered prayer the next day or a week later or whenever, he would go back to the day that he first prayed that and he would write in the margin the dates as to when God showed up and God, you know, did what he asked. And so, you know, that is a great way to pray. It's a great way. If you're really struggling and keeping your attention you know, focused on him, write them out. But I know when I've done that on occasions, I would not just write them out, but as I'm writing, I would speak them because there's just something about the connection of the words that the angels just take them. Not that it's, it's, it's express mail, Lisa, or it's not, you know, priority mail. They used to just work post office, I understand. You know, it, it's not that you're getting one up. It's it's just it helps keep you laser focused on what is being said. Because here's the thing, without our words, prayers can lose conciseness. And David here says, oh, I, I, I want to be perfectly clear, crystal clear. This is what I need. Lord, I'm pleading to you for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. I reveal my trouble to him. And, and so this is the heart of his prayer. I mean, Right up front, he says, this is what's bothering me. He says, with all the praise that's you know, being lifted to the throne of God, he says, I'm coming to complain. <laughs> uh, don't you just love it when somebody complains? Do you know somebody that you don't even ask them anymore how they're doing? Because, I mean, they'll just go on and on and on and tell you every problem from a, an ingrown toenail to a to an abscess tooth, to an earache, to, you know, to their aunt, you know, Betty Sue, who's, who's got cataracts. And I mean, not that those things aren't important, and not that we shouldn't pray for them, but I mean, it's like their pig pen from Charlie Brown. I mean, if you know who pig pen is, he's the one that when he walks around in the cartoons, it, it, just a dust cloud follows him. I mean, he is just nothing seems to go right for pig pen. I mean, it's just, it's miserable. I mean, he's Eeyore on steroids. And, and so here, it's important for us to see that David is coming, he says, and you know, Lord, I'm bringing a complaint. And here are the angels, they're bombarding the throne with all the praise. But here's a good word for you and me. When we find ourselves up against a wall, when we find ourselves in great duress or stress, even though there's all of this wonderful praise around him, when you first cry out to the Lord, he hears your cry. 
I mean, it's like, you know, we got a lot of ladies here today, you know, a couple of thorns among all these, these, these flowers here. Uh, if you've had a child or been around somebody who has a child, y'all can be engaged in a conversation with other adults and the kids can be playing on the other end of the house or even out in the backyard. But if your child suddenly cries out, what happens? Your ears go up. You hear that cry. You know that cry because it's your child. And, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. I mean, immediately your focus is turned in that direction. Or how many times have we been, you know, maybe in a conversation or playing a game with, you know, friends or whatever, and, you know, one of the kids come running in and the tears are streaming down their face and they're hurting, they're upset, and what do you do? Do you get out of here? You know, you kick them like a dog. And they go on, suck it up. You know, <laughs> be Rambo. Don't act like that way. No, we don't do that. What do you do? Especially if it's a grandkid. Boy, you scoop them up. And you love on them, man. And you console them until finally they're able to walk away. And maybe they're still sniffling a little bit. Or there may be still a tear or two coming down. But you know what? A smile has come to their face. Why? Because... You know, Grandpa or Mama or whoever or Mama or Daddy were more concerned about me than winning that round of Monopoly. They were more concerned. I mean, isn't that the way our Heavenly Father is? I mean, He's always listening. He's always planning. He's always looking out for us and how He can lead us in the perfect way. I mean, He's sovereign. He's in control of all things, not just the good things, but the bad things. Years ago, Fanny Crosby, who wrote a lot of hymns, here's a verse from one of my favorite. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been what? My God. Heavenly, ple heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell, for I know what e'er befall me. What happens? Anybody know this song? Jesus doeth all things well. For I know what e'er befalls me. Jesus doeth all things well. I mean, regardless. I mean, he's big enough. What David realizes here, he's crying out to the Lord God. He's crying out to Jehovah. And he's saying, you know... <laughs> I know you hear me, and I know you love those that love you. And the good news is, no matter how busy we may be, if it's our kids, we comfort. And here's the good thing. No matter what's going on in the universe or all of creation, there's never a time we can't stop and just cry out to the Lord. He hears our due rest. But also, we look here, we see in verse 3, he's desperate. He says, my spirit is weak within me. You know my way. Along this path I travel, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. No one stands up for me. There's no refuge for me. No one cares about me. You know, that takes you back to that song. No one likes me. Nobody, nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. Think I'll eat some worms. I mean, that's really where David's at at this moment. I mean, he's feeling so desperate. And what's causing that desperation? Well, fear. Fear causes us to get desperate. I mean, he has all this internal stress. It says, my spirit is weak. You know my way. Uh, it's weak within me. I mean, he's overwhelmed, which literally means, when he says the spirit is weak within me, that phrase, weak within me, is also translated some overwhelmed. In others, it says, that my spirit has been blackened which or has blacked out. In other words, what he's saying here, I am under so much stress, I have passed out. <laughs> he just fainted. I mean, this shows how great the anxiety was. And the only thing that really is keeping David sane at this point in his life is he knows that God doeth all things well. He knows that God has everything in his control. And here's the thing. 
even though David says, look, there's no one around me, no one stands up for me, there's no one for me to run to, but look what he says in verse 4. No one cares about me, but there is one who cares. And that's the only reason why he didn't, you know, really just go outside the cave and jump off the cliff. I mean, he recognized that when there's no one else, he, he didn't need to go to anybody. He had the Lord. That's why he was crying out to the Lord, not to anyone else. And, and we see that not only did he have internal stress, he had this external stress because this is the third time we've seen in one of his psalms that he says there are those who have set a trap for me. There are those who are trying to ensnare me, to catch me. I mean, there's nothing worse in life than living in, in such a way that you think that there is a, a boogeyman behind every door. I mean, you're so paranoid that you automatically think the worst of everybody. I mean, David, wherever he went, you know, as he was, if he stepped out of that cave, he just could imagine that some of them, there was going to be someone outside that cave ready to pounce on him. And that's the kind of stress he was feeling because he knew that the world was being stacked up against him. And there are times in our lives it seems like there, there is nobody. There's no one who, who hears me. There's no one who, who seems to care. And, and we see that also he, he has desperation there in verse 4 because he doesn't have any friends. I mean, like I said, when he first got to Adalam, that cave was empty. And how, how lonely do you think it was at night? I mean, when he stared up at that, those dark walls and Maybe he had a little fire going in there. I mean, he was, it was some long, long nights. And I imagine he slept so lightly that if a bug jumped off a rock onto another rock, he probably heard that bug jump. I mean, he flinched at any sound because he wasn't sure who, who or what was in there and who was sneaking up on him. I mean, he was constantly battling you know the mind where i believe the enemy was telling him saul is just a few steps away and and look all of your so-called friends they have abandoned you i mean look at jonathan where's jonathan jonathan was a friend who stuck closer than a brother they they became like blood brothers you know they had a pact that if something happened to david and david had children jonathan would take care of his children if something happened to Jonathan, David would take care of, of Jonathan's children. Make sure that they were cared for. And, and so where is Jonathan? Did he finally get enough of David and, and seeing that David, you know, you know, he just had AIDS. I mean, he had a big red scarlet letter on him. I mean, he had a target on his back. And, and you say, well, he finally woke up and realized that that he was better off taking the side of his father. No, I don't think Jonathan did any of that. Truth be told, now this is my opinion for what it's worth, I think the reason why we don't see Jonathan here is because Jonathan knows that all the eyes of his father are watching him. And if he even got within 100 yards of David, he could lead to David's capture. And, and so as much as I believe it was probably you know, hurting Jonathan not to be able to, to connect with David and, and to give David progress reports and, and encourage him and, and just, you know, show that brotherly love to him. And he said, best thing I can do is keep my distance. And, of course, here he was doing the most loving thing he could do for, for David, but isn't that what the enemy always does? Satan always takes the goodness of God and he tries to twist it and make it look like nobody cares and that you are all alone. But it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Yes, he felt abandoned because of Satan. Those that were in the palace that had been his friends in the early days, they were what we call fair-weathered. <laughs> and when it came to their own safety, they were more concerned about their necks than they were about their allegiance to David. But here's what David really says. He says, that last five words of verse 4. No one cares about me. From a spiritual standpoint, David 
could have thought this. He says, you know, he says, it would be great if I had a thousand men who came and said, I will, I will lay my life down for you, David. I'll do whatever I can to, to fight for you, to defend you. But I think at this point in David's life, not just physically is he hurting, emotionally is he hurting, I think spiritually. He said, I just wish there was somebody, just somebody who cared about Someone who, who just simply maybe sent a message and said, David, I, you know, I'm not much. I, there's nothing I can really do to fight for you. But tell me, friend, how can I pray for you? you know, how can I intercede? What, what do you need spiritually? How can I encourage you? And David says there's not anybody who cared about his soul. And, and if you think about it, those are really the, the driving, that's the driving motivation for a missionary is that a missionary or a soul winner, the last thing we want to do is one day end up before the, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment, and we're standing there you know, in the gallery because we're saved, but as the white throne judgment is taking place and those that never received Christ are being you know, cast into the lake of fire, the last thing any of us want is for somebody to look at us and say, Sherry, didn't you care? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? I mean, Nancy, why, why didn't you tell me? I mean, I was your neighbor for, for 10 years, and you never, ever mentioned Jesus to me. You never, ever cared about whether I was saved or not. See, that should be what drives us, is that we never have to fear that we will one day stand and have somebody say that to us. See, David didn't feel like there was anybody there for him. But here's the good news. Although no one had reached out to him or seemed to care, he still knew that the Lord was there. And look at the discernment here, how the discernment takes over the desperation in verse 5. He says, I cry to you, Lord, I say this, you are my shelter, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am very weak. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. And so he begins here, he says, Lord, you're my portion. He says, you're my shelter, my portion. And so he says, I know I'm blessed, even though I'm alone, even though I feel abandoned, even though I don't think there's anybody in this world who really you know, gives a hoot about me. Lord, you are there. And, and you have given me protection. You have given me shelter. And, and this shelter here, not only you know exactly what I need. That phrase, land of the living, is found, I believe, 11 times in the Bible. And, and sometimes people get confused. They think that's talking about heaven. That's talking about when we leave this earth because we live in the land of the dead. I mean, everything that's in this world is dying, right? But really, it's not talking about heaven, or, or, and we, we sometimes don't think about this, but, but not only will there be life in heaven, there'll be life in hell. I mean, hell is forever too. But he's not talking about heaven or hell here. One or the other. What he's talking about are the current circumstances, the fact that, that we are alive here on earth. And although the circumstances may not be that great for David right now, he says it's still good to be alive. You are my portion in this time. You are my portion here in this case. With all things considered, you're all I need. And what more could I ask for? So he's blessed by the portion. But we also see he's blessed by the protection. He says, listen to my cry. I'm weak, very weak. Rescue me. Rescue me. Now, who is the one who seems to have all the strength? The ones that are pursuing David. You ever notice this? It always seems like the devil has all the muscle. <laughs> and, and you know why that's done that way? Because the devil knows that you and I are often influenced by, by perception and what we see. God doesn't have to flex his muscle, does he? All he has to do is speak a word. I mean, the enemy, Satan, loves to make it look like he's got all this physical force or power. 
But when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, it just needs to be Jesus. Because all that, all that display of power is nothing compared to him. I mean, Saul, look at Saul. He, he was king. He had the whole, the, the whole government behind him. He had the army of Israel at his beck and call. He had a collection of spies that were scattered across the land that were on the lookout for David. And with all he had, did he beat David? No. I mean, he even ended up in a cave with David one time. And he wasn't even aware enough of his surroundings to realize that he had David cornered right there. Why was that? Because God threw up some magical lightning sword that protected David? No. God didn't have to show a lot of force. His protection and his word is all that we need. The any advantage that Saul may have thought he had was wiped out with three little letters. You know what those letters are? G-O-D. Saul didn't have God on his side. And even though David couldn't see the end of the story there in Adullam, it would come sooner than later. Because it wouldn't be very long, just a few years, which is nothing compared to to the length of his reign. But what happened? Saul was defeated. He was killed on the battlefield. His body was taken to Bethshane. And it was hung there on the outer wall of that city. I mean, David would then assume the throne in Jerusalem. He would become the greatest king that's ever sat on that throne. Second only to the one who is to come. I mean... The one who is to come, who will be the greatest king of all, will come through the, has come through the lineage of David, just as God promised. And, and that one, of course, is Jesus Christ who's coming. So with all of this said, and with all of what was going on around him, and even though it didn't make sense at this point, I believe God gave him enough peace <laughs> that and he could somehow close his eyes at night and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Because I am the Lord's. And friend, if you're a follower of Christ, you've got that same blessing. You've got that same assurance. doesn't mean everything's going to work out just like we think it should. But you can rest assured that God will win. And he wins for you. Well, look at this last verse. Here we see that deliverance, deliverance is coming. He says, free me from prison so that I can praise your name. I mean, David is, in all of his desperation, he could rest in knowing that deliverance is going to come. And deliverance comes in three ways. It comes in freedom, freedom from prison. See, de the devil and had worked in such a way in David's mind and emotions with all the circumstances to make him feel incarcerated there in that cave that he was you know, backed into that corner. He had nowhere to go. But the freedom that he's saying here, Lord, will you free me from, you know, my prison, it's not just from the physical or circumstantial. It's, he's saying spiritually, will I be free? Can I rest in knowing who you are? And here we recognize, he, he says, Lord, it's you that frees me because nobody else can free me. I mean, when, when you're asking for spiritual freedom, it has to come from the Holy Spirit. It comes from God. It doesn't come from man. But when we allow ourselves to be wrapped up in fear, it will imprison us as well as sometimes give us an attitude of, of retaliation and revenge. And David had to be careful. I remember later when he was in that cave in En Gedi with Saul, he had every chance there that he could have he taken Saul's life. But what did David say? I'm not going to touch the head of the king. He's the anointed of God. So he didn't allow bitterness to come in. And what David is saying here is, Lord, when you free me from prison, you're going to take away the depression, you're going to take away the duress, you're going to take away the worry, and I am going to return to the joy of my salvation. Think about it. That's what robs us most in our daily life is we let circumstances rob us of the truth, and we robs us of his joy. And so freedom is on the way, but also look what it says. 
He says, the righteous will gather around me. So fellowship is coming. Not only freedom, where he'll be able to praise the name again, but he says, the righteous will gather around me. Not the enemy, but the righteous. Who are the righteous? They're, they're going to be his friends. They're the ones that are sent by God. I mean, David's been battling loneliness, and here he's saying, Lord, I know you're going to send. You're going to send those that I need. And when they come, they're going to be righteous. They're going to speak truth. They're going to speak freedom. And when he said, when the way this is written in the original language, it's not something that he's just looking forward to. It's something he already has. He says, Lord, you've already given this to me, and I'm just waiting to see it realized in even a bigger way. And so really he's saying, I long for the righteous because they're the ones who <laughs> are my kind of people. I mean, we don't know how long it was. It may have been days, weeks, maybe even a few months. But the day was coming in that cave that it was going to be a lot of laughter. And it was just going to just resonate with those that were there that were high-fiving, fist-pumping, you know, hugging David and just saying, we're here for you now. We're here for you now. Fellowship is coming. If you feel alone... <laughs> Seek the Lord, and he will fill you with those that can lift you up. And then look finally, he says, because you deal generously with me. It doesn't say you deal sparingly with me, or you give me just enough to get by. What does it say? He says, you deal how? Generously. Generously. In other words, not only is freedom on the way, fellowship with friends is coming, but fullness is coming. I mean, anything that God does in your life and my life, he doesn't do it halfway. He doesn't spoon feed us. He, if we are desiring him and seeking him, he will lavish us. He will pour out the blessings. I mean, he's not a stingy father. And David knew that the cave would be filled. And he knew that he had a God he could trust. Because he had always been faithful. He was faithful to him when he was out there watching the sheep. He was faithful to him when he walked down in the valley of Elah with those five stones to face Goliath. But I want you to not miss this. When he ends the psalm, where is David physically? Where is he at? Not a trick question. Has anything changed? He's still in the valley of the shadow of death. They're in Adalam. It's an emotional valley. But notice, the way this psalm ends, you can't help but say, there, here's a man who, he's certainly not the one who started out here in verses 1, 2, and 3. When you get to verses 6 and 7, this is a man who has had a major transformation. He has been taken from a low point emotionally and spiritually to really the height of his relationship with the Lord. Now, does that mean that everything had been fixed? No, he was still in the middle of it. And this is one of the best lessons you and I can learn as a math skill. You know, we can positionally see ourselves in that position of blessing even before the blessing comes. That's what faith is. That's what faith living is, is that we're trusting him. And so, Lord, I pray that some of us may find our backs against the wall in the coming days or weeks because of a, a doctor's report. We may find our backs against the wall because of rising interest rates and prices at the grocery store and at the gas pump. Or we find our backs against the wall due to, to the regulations and restrictions they continue to try to put on us who, who profess the name of Jesus. Lord, no matter what the circumstances may look like, may we choose to live out of the reality of what you have promised us and what we can possess now because of who you are. And if we do, then we will be able to praise you like David did. We'll be able to give you glory and the honor you're due. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great Wednesday. And Lord willing, we'll see you this Sunday.
as we'll continue there in 1 John chapter 5. If you're in the service on the hill or here at 11 and at 9.30, we will have a special ordination service this Sunday for one of our new deacons. God bless you. Have a great, great day.